basically. Are we going to keep printing money and pumping it into there? It's basically the, the world's largest Ponzi scheme is Social Security. You know, it's if it were to run out and if that Ponzi scheme were to end up, it's going to be catastrophic to our economy and the well-being of retirees all over the world. I think the costs of healthcare um, are going to continue to rise. I think we're going to have a lot of challenges and inflation around healthcare that is just going to make the inflationary problem that we have get potentially worse. Hey, what's going on, cash flow hackers? It is Chris with Life 180, and for this video, we're going to be talking about the top 10 economic issues that we need to be monitoring in the United States right now, or I, I guess, yeah, mostly the United States, North America. Um, but I think it's really important because there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. There's a lot of uh, just unknowns going on in the economy. And so these are 10 issues that I think uh, are going to have a, an impact on ultimately how your personal financial strategy will have to be managed here moving forward. So let's get into this. Number one is government expenditures and deficits. Now, I'm a huge believer in capitalism, right? So I, I'm a big believer that small government is what this country is all about. It's important that government doesn't infringe on the rights of businesses. It's just how I believe it. So when you look at the fact that right now the GDP, which by the way, gross domestic product, which is the sum of consumption by Americans, investments by Americans, and also spending by government, right? So if you think about it as an equation, it's GDP equals C plus I plus G, right? Like that, that, that's kind of how it all breaks down. So if you look at just the bump in the increase that the United States government spending part of that equation is of the GDP, which leads to inflation, right? Like that's how it's calculated. The CPI is based on the gross domestic product, right? And the CPI is ultimately where our inflation number comes from. Just since 2011, our, the government spending has increased from 24% of the equation to 30% of the equation. Now that's a big number. And if you look at the bump that it's had actually over the long term since the late 40s, early 50s, it's gotten consistently and consistently worse. And if that trend continues, the amount of government expenditure that, you know, that we have could have a hugely negative impact on our nation's ability to consume goods and build plants and equipment that actually lead to future economic growth. Because let's face it, the only way that you build a real good sustainable economy is to have production, not just consumption. And unfortunately, that's kind of where we are right now. We're not a nation of production. Uh, we used to be a nation of that was one of the, the greatest producers in the world and the greatest creditors or the greatest, yeah, creditors in the world. Now we're one of the greatest debtors and consumers in the world. So that's a really uh, scary situation to be in. So the second thing to monitor right now is Social Security. Now I know there's a lot of you watching that probably don't even believe Social Security will be there. Uh, you're not relying on it. But the bottom line is if you look at Social Security, so I got this debt clock here. And when you go down here, and you look at social security liability right around my mouse right here, right where I'm circling, the usdatclock.org, awesome tool by the way, nearly $22 trillion, $22 trillion, which is absolutely uh, insane to me to think about the fact that, you know, we have $22 trillion of uh, basically of an uh, unfunded liability uh, in social security and we don't have any money there, right? There's no money in that thing. And it's, the bottom line is like, this is the way I look at it. I know a, a, probably a lot of people watching, you know, this video are not believers in social security. They're not banking on it. You're not planning on it. But the sad reality is social security is a big portion uh, of the overwhelming majority of Americans retirement plans. It, it like, it, it, it's, it's really sad. If you start talking to people, it's, it's a huge percentage of what people are relying on in, in, in retirement in, in this country. So if this pool were to run out of money, which it already is out of money, it's just a matter of, are we gonna fund it properly? Are we gonna keep printing money and pumping it into there? It's basically the, the world's largest Ponzi scheme is Social Security. You know, it's, if it were to run out and if that Ponzi scheme were to end up, it's gonna be catastrophic to our economy and the well-being of retirees all over the world. So it's important. Going to number three now. So number three is actually median family income. So when you look at uh, median family economic data, family economic data, you, you really start to think about this 
the middle class looks like it's under siege. And it is because when you think about it, we talk about inflation a lot. I've been talking about inflation a ton lately. Statistics show that median family income, when you adjust it for inflation, you actually increased drastically. So the quality of living for the median family, the, the middle America, increased drastically from 1947 to 1970, due in large part to what I just talked about before, which was an increase in productivity in our country. But the problem is, is that since then, incomes have become stagnant, not keeping up with inflation. That's in large part due to a reduction in actual productivity in the US as a whole, right? So like you realize that if, if, if incomes, wages, and productivity is not keeping up with inflation, you can't just print money and hope that, you know, rely on the fact that we're the world's reserve currency and think that that's gonna bail us out. It's the reason that it's vital for people to change their financial strategies because if you can't keep up with the median family income and if like just doing what everybody else is doing is getting the results where 90, 97% of the people in this country are failing with their financial strategies, you have to do something else. You just have to. So number four, I'm gonna piggyback on the last one, is the US savings rate. Now this is actually way worse than it seems because the government considers any money that uh, is actually saved for retirement or in any vehicle as money that counts towards the savings rate. Now, here's the problem. If you watch a lot of my videos, you understand that investing and saving are entirely two different things, right? You need to be able, I'm a big believer, I, sh I should say, that you need to be able to save before you invest and put too much money into investments, right? You, if, you, if you put too much money into investments too early without saving first, you're putting yourself at risk unnecessarily, right? Because what happens, we talk about these cycles all the time, what happens is when we have a downward cycle, you may feel like you're doing well, but if you don't have money in a safe, guaranteed, liquid, you know, accessible account, you're gonna be completely financially exposed, um, and that's ultimately what happens. When you, when you invest too much before saving and building your financial foundation, it leaves you exposed and, and puts you at risk and forces you into making bad decisions. Now, while the savings rate right now has improved back to the averages from like the 60s to the 90s, which is like nearly 10%, uh, it's important to note that, you know, what I just said is, is key to understand. It's not just if people are saving, but where they're saving that matters the most, right? So a study in 2015 actually showed that 64% of Americans had less than $2,000 liquid and accessible in case of an emergency, right? That's what I'm talking about. If you don't have that money and if you don't have that money saved versus invested and tied up in your 401k or qualified account, you are completely exposed. Now, an even scarier statistic that I just found the other day is that during COVID, 60% of Americans said they, they could not come up with $400 to cover an emergency it's a really, really scary position to be in. So make sure you're saving before you invest and make sure your savings rate is up there. Make sure you're saving, I would say 15 to 20% of your income. Uh, that is, if you haven't saved and if you're behind the ball, that's what I would do. So number five, the consumption binge that is going on in this country. Look at all the COVID checks and all the stimulus money that came into people and rather than saving it, paying down debt, doing all these things, people ran to Costco, they ran to Best Buy, they bought flat screen TVs, they did home renovations, they took vacations now that they can, they bought furnitures for their house, they bought cars, they did all these things and the level of consumption and consumer debt in this country has never been higher. It just eclipsed $15 trillion for the first time in our country's history, which is a really, really scary thing in my estimation and if the market, the, 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 well, let me say it this way. If the market doesn't keep up its white hot trend, like this trajectory of growth and inflation, like, it, you know, there's just, there's just the growth in stocks and, 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 and just the statistics that are out there in everything. I don't have time to go through it in this video. What's going to happen is millions of people are going to be in a lot of trouble because there's a lot of debt and they're not going to be ready for it. They're just not. So number six is a retirement savings crisis. Uh, according to Fidelity, think about it, listen to these statistics. According to Fidelity, the following is what the average American has saved for retirement. If you're 20 to 29 years old, you have $15,000 on average. If you're 30 to 39, 
you have $50,800. If you're 40 to 49, you have just over $120,000. If you're 50 to 59, you have $203,000. And if you're 60 to 69, you have $229,000. Now those are the average for each age bracket. And when you think about what that money will actually do, or in this case not do for people, it's actually like to me a really scary picture because like if you look at the 4% rule and you have $200,000, $200, you're, you're only gonna be able to pull $8,000 a year of income on that without having a, a huge risk of running out of money during retirement. And when the average family, uh, you know, is only, only has $200,000, $29,000 that says they're going to have about $9,000 of income, right? These numbers show exactly why the current model of saving, quote unquote, right? Because that's, they always try to say you're saving in a retirement account. You're not saving, you're taking risk, you're, you're investing, you're, you're doing things the wrong way. It's showing why the system is broken and it's exactly why we created cash flow hacking to show people why the current system is broken and how you can invest for cash flow. Because when you look at those numbers and when you look at the fact that the average 50 and 60 and 65 year old are so far behind and are not gonna be able to maintain their standard of living, I think people are feeling helpless and hopeless. And the idea of investing for cash flow and why we created cash flow hacking to show people how you can reach financial freedom in 10 years or less is it, through our strategies on a very, very predictable basis. It's why it's so important. It really is. It, it's, it's because of those numbers when you look at it. It's, a, it's an abysmal statistic, but if that is you, uh, I'm gonna tell you right now, there is still hope. All right, so number seven is family debt. Now, I kind of alluded to this uh, a little bit earlier, but debt in this country is getting out of control. Bankrate just did a study that showed 42% of Americans have actually increased their credit card debt since the beginning of COVID. Now, this is a very bad thing. Remember, debt is fixed where asset values are variable, right? It's important to understand. Not, not, I, let me just give you an example of this, right? So you can purchase a home with a mortgage. Now, I'm, not that I'm uh, saying I think you shouldn't get a mortgage. I think mortgages are a fantastic thing. I'm just gonna use your home as an example. And the, here's the bottom line. The debt that you have with that home won't change. Now, you may have uh, variable interest rates or fixed interest rates it, or a fixed interest rate. It doesn't really matter but the amount that you owe is fixed, right? Like obviously I would steer clear of a variable interest rate loan uh, no matter what right now um, because of the inflation rates and everything that's going on. I, I think people are gonna be potentially at some significant risk with variable interest rates, but the asset that you have, the house, the reality is it can go down in value. And if it does, just look at 2008, you're gonna still owe that money. And this is, uh, ultimately, this is what leads to amplifying the speed of a financial crisis. The reduction of household debt in this country is imperative. If you wanna be in a better financial situation, make sure that you get your debt down, right? You, you just have to pay that debt down, pay the credit card debt down, pay the car debt down. Your home uh, is a different animal. I use that as the example here. Um, but it's also a reason that you know, people ask me my opinion on real estate and I'll just kind of throw it in here right now. I don't think, I, I think buying a home, like a, your personal residence is potentially dangerous right now. You know, if, if you haven't bought or if you're thinking about buying, I would wait if it were me, right? I'm not, this isn't personal advice to you and your situation, but I would personally wait because I think the risk is too high. Now, I like cash flow real estate right now and I would buy properties in this very moment, if you found the right property that was positively cash flowing, because I'm not thinking about, I'm not worried about um, the value of that home. I'm worried about the cash flow. Can the cash flow coming in cover my mortgage? Is it covered? Right? Like, it, what's the return, cash on cash return that I'm getting from that? And if those numbers make sense, well, when the market goes down, typically what happens is it adds, uh, it adds uh, momentum to the rental market, right? So, like, when foreclosures go up, that's what drives prices down. When, when foreclosures go up, it pushes more people into the rental market, and so your cash flow on your property, even if you lose value in the property, it's gonna, you're gonna be able to maintain uh, that rent, right, or even increase that rent potentially. So it just makes sense. But for a private home that you're not cash flowing, that's a lifestyle expense and so on and so forth, um, and if you don't own it already, I would really, be hesitant about going out and buying a home right now. All right, so number eight 
is healthcare costs and the health of Americans. It is pretty scary right now. Baby boomers are getting older, and with that, total medical costs in this country just continue to rise at levels that we've never seen before. Um, in addition to this, here's, here's the bottom line, and, and I'm gonna get on my soapbox a little bit here. Uh, this may not be a very popular stance, but over 80% of medical expenses in the United States right now are due to chronic medical conditions, which ultimately means that they could be avoided with different lifestyle choices like exercise and food choices in most cases. Now, uh, like I said, I know this isn't a popular stance, but especially in a COVID world right now, think about this, in, in, in this COVID world where we know that keeping your cardio health up and eating healthy might literally be the difference between life and death, why are the lines at all these fast food joints still wrapping around the building, even more so wrapping around the building, when we know it's just such an incongruent way of living, right? Like, listen, I was one of those people that, that totally downplayed COVID. Um, and I'll, and I'll say that because I just was like, I'm somebody who thinks about my health. I eat healthy. I exercise. I'm active. I'm cardio wise. I'm awesome. And I actually just got done getting destroyed by the Delta variant of COVID. And, um, it had me in bed for 19 days, 19 days, no joke. And, um, it killed my productivity. I'm blessed that I had some amazing people around me that supported me and, 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 and helped my businesses keep going, some great business partners. And, and so from that perspective, uh, I, I, I just feel I'm super grateful. Um, but it was a wake-up call. It was a bit of a humbling experience for me because it made me realize how serious COVID really is. I was the guy that was like, ah, only uh, you know, older people are at risk and only uh, you know, overweight people are at risk. And those people should you know, absolutely be considering uh, you know, what their options are for different ways to, to manage their COVID risk. Uh, but for me, I was like, ah, I don't even care if I get it because, uh, if I get it, I'm healthy, no big deal. Now I was never in any danger. I never had to get hospitalized. My oxygen levels were never at risk because I am healthy, but it doesn't change the fact that for three weeks, my life was a complete miserable mess because the body aches and everything, it was horrible. Now going back to the, the concept of the healthcare crisis, I don't think this is going away. I think where we are right now, I think uh, the, 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 the virus is gonna keep continuing to evolve. We're gonna get different variants. Um, I think the costs of healthcare um, are gonna continue to rise. I think we're gonna have a lot of challenges and inflation around healthcare that is just gonna make the inflationary problem that we have get potentially worse. So that's something uh, to consider. Um, and I really, I want to encourage everybody to really think about making healthy decisions, to realize and take control and do the best you can. I realize everybody's in an absolutely different situation. Everybody's in a different environment, uh, but we can all make better decisions on a daily basis when it comes to our health, when it comes to our activity, even if it's getting out, walking around the block and getting some exercise or something, um, I would say it's really important. So go out there, make good decisions, uh, be the best version of yourself that you can be. Um, and I'm going to get off my soapbox now. So anyway, that's that. All right. So number nine is the national debt. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to my, my fun little debt clock here. And, uh, I want to show you, this is the U S national debt. Look at how fast this debt is going up. We're at $28 trillion in debt. We've gone up literally a couple billion dollars just since yesterday. I was looking at this last night. Look at this, how fast it's going up, $100,000, $200,000. It's just going up crazy. Like, you know, it, it, it's literally going up like $100,000 every, let, let's see how, what this, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000. Every four seconds, guys, we're, 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 our national debt is going up $100,000. Think about that. That is right there. That is a scary, scary number, right? So inflation or the, the national debt is at ratios that we haven't seen in this country, like national debt and the deficit that's going on in this country is a scary, scary thing. I don't know how we keep up with it. You could literally stack the money to the moon and back. I think at this point in time, the amount of money that we owe and, um, you know, 
It's if you haven't, I would go check out usdebtclock.org. It gives you all these statistics on all this thing, debt per person. Look at this, US debt, to GDP ratio, this is important. 1960 was 52%, 1980 was actually went down to 34%, 2000 went back up to 50%, and remember 60, that was coming out of the war. We're at 125, almost 126% as far as federal debt to the GDP ratio. That is a scary, scary statistic. It is something we need to take very, very seriously. I think when you combine the debt with the money printing, with the velocity of money, the money hitting the market and the economy and all that stuff, it's just putting us in a situation where this is what leads to what I think is probably one of the biggest concerns, one of the most talked about concerns right now. I've even mentioned it in this video kind of in passing a couple times because of the topics and just the nature of, of, of the economy. And that is number 10 is inflation. So inflation, many people right now are, attribute, are attributing inflationary pressures to COVID, supply chain issues, uh, you know, all that stuff that comes with COVID ultimately right now. And they're saying it's transitory that, you know, we're having a high spike of inflation right now, but it's transitory, it's under control, and it's only because COVID and the supply chain issues. So when we fix those, we'll fix that. Reality, nothing could be further from the truth, in my opinion, because the U.S. has printed 30% of all money that has ever been created in the U.S. supply of money supply in our history. 30% of all money that's ever been created in the United States has been created since September of 2019. You can't print that much money without creating inflationary pressure once the money starts to actually hit the market. Now, here's the deal. People are going, well, we've printed it. We haven't really had bad inflation. We're starting to have inflation right now, right? With the 6.2% we're at, and I think it's gonna get worse. And the reality is the money won't actually, the inflation won't actually occur until the money goes into movement. It actually hits motion. If you look at the money that's printed and the money that's on reserves, a lot of that money is sitting in reserves right now. And as soon as that money starts to get out into the economy, it's gonna get worse. Now, on top of that, here's the deal. like. Inflation is so bad because it works against us in two ways, right? When the economy goes through a correction cycle like it does every eight to 12 years, a typical American loses 30 to 40% of the value in their retirement plan. But the thing is the value of that money doesn't go down. When you look at inflation every year, it eats into the returns. Like, so for instance, if you have a 6% return on your portfolio and we have 6% inflation, the nominal increase of your portfolio value was zero, right? Like, cause your purchasing power didn't really go up. The purpose of saving and investing and getting a return is to increase your standard of living or have that money grow faster. So it's, it's leverage. That's the idea is your money makes money, right? And, and when your money makes money over a period of time, it works out for you and that's how you're able to retire. Now, the problem is, you know, we're in a situation right now where if you, were to lose 30 to 40% of your uh, retirement nest egg or, or money that you had like people did in 2008, what happened in 2008 is the average American lost 40% of their retirement portfolio, but the value of that money only went down four tenths of a percentage point, not even 1%. So think about that, right? Like it's, it's crazy. When the market goes down 40%, after that, the market needs to go up nearly 100% from that bottom point just for your account to get back to even. So, but the crazy part is because of the inflation, once it gets back to even, inflation is once again working against you. So the money that you have actually won't nominally be worth what it was worth when you lost it in the first place. So when you look at this stuff, it can actually be really mind bending because it's not about how much money you have, it's about what this what your money is going to actually do for you, you know? So it's like, it's, it's astounding to me, you know, all these issues. And what I want to say, I guess now is that's it for this video. You know, those are the 10 things that I think everybody should be monitoring in the economy right now. And if you found value in this video, please smash the like button. It really helps the channel a ton, gets the YouTube algorithm, loves it, gets it out there. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe, hit the bell, that way you get notified 
every single time we launch a new video. Uh, and make sure to check the description below for all the links, for more education, uh, product services, offerings that we have that can help you out. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, let us know. And until next time, have a blessed, inspirational day, and we'll see you on the next video. See ya.